Greetings, everyone. Welcome. I'm Ikram Chama, as you can see my name on the screen. Uh, my pronouns are she and her. I am the Director of Equity and Human Rights at the Department of Equity and Inclusive Communities. And I would like us to begin today by acknowledging that the land on which we gather is the traditional and unceded territory of the Algonquin Nation. I wanna thank you again for joining us today um, the, for the second session of the EDI Speaker Series. The Equity, Diversity and Inclusion Speaker Series is an initiative of the Department of Equity and Inclusive Communities. And it's funded by the Canada Researchers Program, uh, their EDI stipend, and we're very grateful for, for that funding. The speaker series is taking place throughout 2023, with four speakers in total coming to Carlton, either in person or virtually. And as you all know, we have the privilege of the second one today with an amazing speaker. Um, the really goal is of the speaker series was is to discuss issues of equity inclusion anti-racism and anti-oppression in the context of higher education. Today, we're delighted to have Dr. Rosalind Hampton here for our second session in the speaker series to discuss whether an equitable and diverse university is possible. Uh, please feel free to submit questions for Dr. Hampton at any time during the talk, and we will use these questions to guide the Q&A section after uh, Dr. Hampton concludes her speaking. Recognizing that we may not be able to get to every question submitted, we'll do our best. Also, all the questions submitted will only be actually visible to the moderators. Um, we also want to share with you that live captioning is available throughout the, the discussion today. Again, thank you so much for joining us for this important conversation. I'm looking forward to it. And I will now pass the mic over to uh, Eunice Olidecho, our EDI Speaker Series Coordinator, to introduce Dr. Hampton. Eunice. Thank you, Ikram. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker for today, Dr. Rosalind Hampton. Dr. Rosalind Hampton works as an Assistant Professor for Black Studies in the Department of Social Justice Education at the Ontario Institute for Studies and Education of the University of Toronto. Her areas of teaching and supervision are centered on Black radical thought, racialized social relations, Black feminist life writing, arts, and creative practice. As a scholar and activist, Dr. Hampton is especially interested in anti-colonial, anti-capitalist solidarities within and beyond academia. She's the author of Black Racialization and Resistance at an Elite University, and her current research and writing examines Black studies initiatives in Canadian universities, Black student activism and coalition building, and critical creative praxis in Black studies research and pedagogy. So it's my uh, pleasure to pass it over to Dr. Rosalind Hampton. Thank you uh, so much, Eunice. And my thanks to you and Krista and Ikram uh, for organizing this event, for inviting me to speak, uh, to Alex for holding down all things technical, uh, technology, technology related. You can see how good I am at technology. I can't even say the word. And especially to our ASL interpreters, Delaine and Daniel. Um, also to anyone else I haven't named uh, who's been involved in organizing and bringing this EDI speaker series um, event to you all. Um, my thanks to everyone listening. I hope um, that uh, the paper I'm going to present stimulates uh, some great conversation. I encourage you to share your comments and questions. And uh, hopefully we'll have a generative conversation after I finish presenting. So I've been asked to talk to you today about a series of questions that I pose um, uh, in the final chapter of my book, uh, where I write about Black people's academic service in and for the neoliberal university. So there I asked um, whether, given the university's foundations and role in society, whether or not an equitable and diverse university is possible. I asked how we respond to the expectation that Black, Indigenous, and other racialized people are the ones responsible for diversifying and decolonizing the university. I asked whom, uh, we do, who we do that work for and how we manage the potential of our work to be used to validate and further entrench the very relations it claims to undo. 
So I've thought and continued to think about these questions a lot in the years since I conducted that research, particularly since I acquired a job as a tenure track professor of Black Studies, and particularly, particularly since the dramatic increase in the recruitment of Black faculty and staff and the creation of uh, initiatives related to Black Studies. So in this talk, I'm gonna revisit some of my earlier work and also consider that work in light of these dramatic spikes in institutional discourse and policy that we've all witnessed in relation to EDI decolonization and addressing anti-Blackness in, um, in the Canadian Academy. My aim um, is to consider how our work and strategies have shifted and or must shift in relation to those of the institutions and how we can continue to remain vigilant in studying, teaching, organizing, and struggling for a different university. Like Habib Sayam, I offer quote, an unconventional, nonlinear, and sometimes nonsensical journey, unquote, as an expression of my preoccupation, and again, I'm quoting Habib here, with how words influence our ways of seeing, thinking, and being, how language is used to reinforce nomothetic ways of seeing, thinking, and being, and to reproduce existing power structures in society. So what I'm referring to here is a 2010 article that Habib Sayam um, published titled Me, We, an unconventional, nonlinear, and sometimes nonsensical journey into the literacy experiences of a wandering mind. As he explains therein, the article's title is inspired by an incident that occurred at the Harvard University commencement ceremony when former heavyweight boxing champion Muhammad Ali was invited to address the graduating class of 2000. Ali, known for his wordplay, was dyslexic and favored succinctness. He gave a speech about the responsibility the graduates had to affect change in the world as they had been afforded educational opportunities that a racist society had denied him. As he concluded, a member of the audience shouted a request for a poem. Ali stared into the microphone and blurted, me, we, before walking off the stage, end quote. Section one, onwards, for Ras Oba Chateau, rest in power, for Tyson and for Vanessa. Like many other scholars, I am concerned with how the academy appropriates the language of activists and racialized and oppressed peoples, often the very language used to critique the institution. Not only does institutional discourse absorb this language, it warps its meanings and weaponizes it in the service of colonial capitalist ruling relations. Words matter and their meanings should never be taken for granted. I first learned this to take this really seriously anyways, not from academia, but from living and studying with Rastafari for many years. Rastafari say words sound power to emphasize the power of language, calling on us to be aware of the sounds we utter and not only what they are intended to mean and refer to, but actually how they sound. This is informed by spiritual belief expressed through the power of prayer, oration, chanting that allows us to communicate with ancestors and the Most High. It matters what we say and how we say it. Rasta know that the English language is corrupt, that it is a tool and site of colonial coercion, and that through sonic conceptual manipulation and trickery, language is used against us. Early Rastafari, predominantly poor Black, uh, urban Black people of, of Jamaica and throughout the Caribbean intervened on both the Queen's so-called standard uh, English that was imposed through colonial, uh, colonialism and on, and they also in, intervened on the Jamaican Creole of the broader masses to develop what some call dread talk. For example, Rastafari place, um, replaced the word oppress with downpress as my elders taught me, up press 
sounds like up press, intentionally creating confusion about the role of the colonial oppressor who never intends to uplift Black people. As scholars such as Rex Nettleford and Velma Pollard have explained, the Rastafari creating these words were theorizing society from the bottom of a white colonial social hierarchy, from an experience of being, and I'm quoting Pollard here, pressed down economically and socially by the establishment, unquote. Dread Talk represents a means of communication reflecting the experiences, perceptions, religious views, and liberty of Rastafari. Rastafari taught me to seek words that actually express our experiences and beliefs that are not tainted with double talk and dangerous implications. Rasta say I as an assertion of the first person self possession of I self, most often asserted in the plural I and I, positing a collective self possession which always includes and speaks through the presence of the ancestors and higher powers. The attachment or replacement of I to the beginning of words is intended to invoke a collective presence, self possession agency and coherence. And again, this isn't limited to Rastafari because we also hear this in Muhammad Ali's poem that, that Habib uh, cited in the, in the passage I read earlier. So Rasta also say poly tricks instead of politics because the formal political realm is never anything otherwise. Rasta say beat down or burn Babylon as a call for the destruction of oppressive state institutions and the systems and practices that uphold them. Rastafari generalize Babylon as a reference to empire and wickedness and use it to refer to the quote, international colonial imperial complex of economic, political, religious and educational institutions and values that have evolved from the colonial experience. And there I was quoting Enos Barrington Edmonds, a professor, a professor of African diaspora religions. So Babylon uses its institutions and agents to brainwash people, to conceal the presence, histories, and knowledges of African and African diaspora people, and to perpetuate misinformation that supports mental slavery. Rastafari taught me this. They taught me abolitionist and black anarchist values and premises long before I encountered and embraced those theories and discourses in my activism and scholarship. So while my academic training is not in the area of linguistics per se, I pay attention to words and I still find myself taking up the somewhat playful and dreadfully serious approach that Rastafari take to language. In recent years, I've presented and published a number of pieces on this, raising urgent concerns about um, the use of the terms and related discourses of um, Black studies, anti-Blackness, Black radicalism, anti-colonialism, Black excellence, Black student success, and most relevant, of course, to the framing of this presentation, equity, diversity, and inclusion. So I'll begin with the latter, inclusion. Inclusion is a tricky word. It refers to both the act of including something or someone that has previously been excluded, as well as to the actual thing or person being included. As many of us have argued by now, we must ask who is assumed to do the including, who is being included, and what are the conditions of inclusion? Relations of natural belonging and non-belonging are implicated in this language. And inclusion in scientific contexts refers to something foreign or abnormal within a substance or context differing from itself. So staying with this last point for the moment, we might think about how we scholars and students who are black, indigenous, disabled, and or otherwise abnormal in the university context are situated as inclusions. And as inclusions, our presence comes to represent or signify the difference within and thus the diversity of the institutional context. 
it is assumed that through equity, our diversity or difference comes to be present. Equity as tolerance, impartiality, objectivity in relation to our presence. So through tolerance and the removal of bias, the university becomes open to inclusions. But I think that if equity is worth fighting for, it cannot be defined as disinterested, detached, and impartial. If equity is about fairness, it must be radically biased against colonialism and capitalism. If we are to argue for equity, it mustn't be about buying into the university we have, as suggested by the term equity capital, for example. If we are to argue for diversity, we must argue for a different university, not merely for difference within the university we have. So from my limited understanding of cell biology for the purposes of this analogy, cell inclusions are not attached to the cell and are not alive. They serve as reserves and store fuel, but do not participate in metabolism and do not grow themselves. Moreover, because they are not attached to the cell, they can come and go imported and exported. In contrast, in geoscience and gemology, inclusions are materials, whether liquid, gases, or solid, that become trapped and permanently enclosed within, mineral, uh, sorry, within minerals and rocks as they are forming. So gemstones are categorized according to notions of purity vis-a-vis -vis the presence and number of inclusions. Inclusions are understood as uh, internal defects, but in some cases, the presence of inclusions also makes the gem more interesting and thus more valuable. So I note here, and then I promise to move from this analogy. The inclusion, whether in a cell or mineral, is in service of that in which it is included. As an example, I've read on the internet machine, explains to me, Amber is a resinous mineraloid that forms as tree sap solidifies over millions of years. If an ant or a piece of plant gets stuck in the sap, it dies and the amber solidifies around them, trapping them permanently inside, preserving their form and sometimes even their DNA. This makes the amber far more valuable than a piece of amber without inclusions. But as far as I can tell, it doesn't do much good for the ants and plants. The amber, <clears throat> the amber may be equitable in that it is indifferent about the nature of the inclusion, and it may be seen as diverse in hosting this difference. But an inclusivity worth fighting for would be genuinely interested in and accountable to the ant and the plant, how they are made, where they come from, what they do. It would not require their death and it would produce a different mineraloid, not a more valuable piece of amber. I call the next, sec uh, the next section of this talk, Racism will not disappear in my lifetime or yours. Annette's mom. I want to return to the presentation by Professor Annette Henry, the first speaker in your series this past February. Professor Henry also suggested the importance of the language we use and the assumptions that inform how we pursue our struggles for a different university. After opening her presentation by introducing her mom as her first teacher of critical race theory, Dr. Henry sought to provide a shared basis for understanding anti-Black racism. She shared a quote by Morgan and Bullen explaining that anti-Black racism is deeply entrenched in Canadian institutions to the extent of being normalized and invisibilized to the larger white society. Professor Henry offered an amendment to this statement 
to acknowledge, and I'm quoting her here, that sometimes policies and practices are just so normalized that people of all races and backgrounds don't question them or don't think about them, unquote. Professor Henry then made the crucial intervention of extending and illustrating her remarks about anti-Blackness to the issue of tuition and the normative association of paying full tuition with receiving, uh, without receiving, sorry, the normative association of paying full tuition with receiving full access to university resources and services. Professor Henry noted how this places working class and less affluent students among which Indigenous and Black students are overrepresented at an inherent disadvantage. As a Black feminist scholar throughout her presentation, she asserted the interlocking nature of race, gender, and economic oppression, or downpression, as central to how we understand and seek to address anti-Black racism. Moreover, Professor Henry noted that the assertion from Morgan and Bullen did not offer quite a definition of anti-Black racism. And she also added that she was unable to locate such a definition in the Scarborough Charter, quote, even though it's talked about all the time, unquote, in that document. In her humility, Professor Henry added that she might be wrong on that, but I don't think she is. And that's something to linger on for a moment, given that it is a national charter on anti-Black racism and Black inclusion in higher education. What are the dangers of assuming that we share an understanding of anti-Black racism and what it refers to? So as part of moving to the second question guiding this talk, that is how we respond to the expectation that Black, Indigenous, and other racialized people are the ones responsible for diversifying and decolonizing the university, I pick up on and build on Professor Henry's questioning and analysis. I think part of how we respond to these expectations is collectively through our understanding of our work as collective and guided by political commitments that help us resist the competitive individualism of academia. The term anti-Black racism is attributed to Dr. Akua Benjamin, a Black community activist in Toronto, a social worker, social work educator, and Professor Emeritus and director, former director of the School of Social Work at what's now called Toronto Metropolitan University. Dr. Benjamin first used the term anti-Black racism in her 2003 PhD dissertation to refer to the institutional violence faced by Black people in Canada. In her dissertation, Benjamin explains that the term was coined during the 1990s by grassroots and working class intellectuals in Toronto's Black uh, community. Um, she describes it as an analytical an analytical weapon in the struggles by the Black community against racism of the police. From its origins then, anti-Black racism was intended to specifically address structural and systemic racism enacted through policies and practices, including violent policies and practices perpetuated against Black people by the police and criminal justice system. So Benjamin's dissertation examines the racialization and criminalization of Black people, particularly Black Jamaicans, in the 1993-1994 re reporting of the Toronto Sun newspaper. She developed anti-Black racism as a theoretical framework that centers on two tenets, two key tenets. One, that anti-Black racism, and I'm quoting her abstract, in fact, here, that anti-Black racism is a particular form of systemic and structural racism, which historically and contemporarily perpetr is perpetrated against Blacks in Canadian society. Anti-Black racism has meaning and salience in a uh, saliency in the perpetuation of dominant and hegemonic systems of whiteness and the marginalization and banishment of Black and Black Jamaicans from Canadian society. So that was the first tenet. The second tenet was that naming anti-Black racism is a form of resistance against dominant and hegemonic systems of whiteness and the building of agency and collective transformation against racism and other forms of oppression. 
So in her dissertation, Benjamin warns against the concept of anti-Black racism being reduced to the notion of, and I'm quoting from page 61 of her dissertation now, she's, she's warning about it being reduced to the notion of hierarchy of oppressions with Black oppression being more severe or important. And she identifies this as something that would undermine and negate what as an activist she knew was the crucial work of anti-capitalist and anti-colonial coalition building. And yet just a couple of years ago, so nearly two decades after Benjamin's dissertation, I would find myself repeating that we need to be cautious about how anti-Black racism is becoming a thing. So I would, this is um, writing that I did for a University of Toronto uh, Press blog post. And there I noted that anti-Black racism was becoming a thing, a commoditized term to be exploited and wielded as capital following the transnational uprisings against police killings of Black people in the summer of 2020. The institutional rush to capitalize on the newly thingified anti-Black racism through trainings, panels, task, for task forces, and in administrative positions, I argued, works to dodge depoliticize and demobilize critical attention um, that we need to be paying to ongoing processes and relations of anti-Black racism. So calling attention to the sloppy use of how, you know, of the term and how it was and to note continues to be quite frankly wielded by university administrations. It seemed to me that universities were moving so quickly to use the term and failing to note that the Canadian university and Canada itself, for that matter, are indeed founded on anti-Black racism. And that ending racism against Black people requires principles of anti-anti-Black racism. Of course, in a significant way, those comments had come too late. Dr. Benjamin's work two decades prior that reflected the theorizing of activists and community organizers outside of academia had already been captured. The creation of various anti-Black racism task forces, trainings, and even faculty positions like my own is part of a system behavior that Taiwo writes of in, as, as elites capturing our conversations. Power works such that people are persuaded by one false story, Taiwo explains, because they already believe another one. If we believe the liberal myths of the idealized university, we will believe that we can eliminate anti-Black racism through working within its frameworks. And those are the frameworks from within which it emerges and is actually reproduced. So we fall into this in good faith, right? Students, faculty, and staff members take up jobs and engage in academic service work framed by the language of EDI and social justice, because those are what are offered to us as legitimate formations for challenging and changing institutional policies and governance. However, we also know and must always remember that when terms are appropriated into dominant discourses, they get swept into and tend to serve dominant power relations. This requires our ongoing rigorous collective work as living, breathing, critically thinking, politicized people to understand how institutions function and adapt so that we can continue to subvert their carceral colonial capitalist logics and practices, and so that we can maintain our orientation toward freedom. So, you know, those of us who've been around for a minute, right? From multiculturalism to critical multiculturalism, to anti-racism, to social justice, to decolonization, to intersectionality, to anti-Black racism, and on and on and on. Activists and critical scholars continuously name, analyze, and seek to change, indeed to abolish, the anti-Blackness and coloniality of contemporary US and Canadian societies and institutions. And a taken for granted racial liberalism consistently steps in 
appropriating our language to claim and render these frameworks apolitical, to redirect them away from the analyses that reveal and orient us towards other possibilities. To refer back to um, Olufemi's, uh, Olufemi Taiwo's uh, book, Elite Capture, um, complex and nuanced values and ideas are captured and revised by the system to be simplified and rendered inadequate and useful to that system. To quote uh, Taiwo here, we find an environment stocked with choices, penalties, and potential rewards that make sense in capitalist terms, unquote. The most obvious choice then, the path of least resistance, the choice that's most likely to be rewarded is to play along with what's already in place. This is the elite capture and what Taiwo calls system behavior that can be changed. This point is critical. It's been made in a lot of different ways by a lot of different scholars. It can be changed, but only if our collective thinking about it and how we respond to it changes. I'm gonna offer us one more term in relation um, to what we're trying to get at um, and what um, Akua Benjamin's trying to get at with anti-Black racism. More recently, anti-Blackness written as one word is gaining increasing use um, by Black scholars in particular, um, scholars of Black studies as a framework that might allow us to get at how the persistent relentless dehumanization of Black people exceeds what can be understood as racism. So this theorizing of anti-Blackness is not to posit a racialized social hierarchy of which Black people are simply positioned at the bottom. Rather, it's meant to reveal and critique the distinct invention of Black people as outside of the realm of the human and as always already outside of the social altogether. So as Vargas and Jung assert, the assumed universal notion of the human has anchored the humanities, while the notion of the social has anchored the social sciences, thus revealing a fundamental anti-Blackness underlying both. They argue, therefore, that we must continuously doubt the adequacy of and rethink all social categories of practice and analysis, and in that they include racism. And again, the, these are arguments that have been made in different versions by different scholars who have like studied in these fields of the arts and social sciences and humanities and consistently come up against the limits that, that, that are built into those um, areas of study. So the recruitment of black students, staff and professors is not only a matter of our deserving to have access to formal education and to develop and conduct research for the betterment of society according to our views. And black studies is a critical intervention in the university, not only because it offers black people and everyone else opportunities to study black histories, cultures and ideas. All of these things uh, are true and are certainly really important. And for many of us, more than anything else, Black studies is a critical intervention in the universities because it shakes the very foundations of their legitimacy and demands the impossible. And this was its vision. Resistance requires that we break out of the compartments into which we've been socially slotted by a white supremacist, colonial, heteropatriarchal, capitalist society that would have us believe that what the state tells us is all that's possible. As Fazl Rizvi reminds us, a social imaginary is not simply inherited and predetermined for us. It's constantly in a state of flux. So we must find ways to challenge and expand our thinking to imagine a better world, even and especially when that seems to require hoping for the impossible. And James Baldwin famously stated in 1963, um, in our time, I'm quoting him here, in our time, as in every time, the impossible is the least that one can demand, unquote. So we should be emboldened by history, he argues, especially black history, 
because indeed it, quote, testifies to nothing less than the perpetual achievement of the impossible, unquote. Hortense Spillers reminded us this um, in her lecture here at U of T last week, you know, that Black Studies is a street movement that entered the academy and enters the academy as a meeting of opposites, a tension between epistemological urgency and political necessity that we shouldn't seek to resolve. We don't come to the university to be comfortable, she instructs. And as scholars of Black studies, we are to remain always in the moment of its impure arrival. As one of the student activists who participated in forcing Black studies through the gates of academia in 1968, Spillers was unwavering and unapologetic in her message. I received that message as if we are activist scholars, we are here to struggle for freedom, not just to wallow in, or worse in my estimation, to exploit and commoditize our downpression. Marginal, marginality, as Bell Hooks teaches us, is the site of radical possibility. It's a space of resistance, and it's a site one stays in, clings to even, because it nourishes our capacity to resist. It offers the possibility of radical perspective from which to see and create and imagine alternatives and new worlds. Section three. I never do this, but just out of my mouth, I said to a colleague, there isn't real diversity here. And he said to me, quick as whatever the expression is, oh, but look, there are people from all over the world. So I said to myself, okay, self, don't talk to people who don't know what you're talking about. That's a quote from a black professor that I interviewed for my research. A black graduate student organizer offered me another quote. They said, there just always seems to be another fight, something else. And I grew wary of it because it just felt like it was never ending, unquote. One last epigraph. And that right there is an underappreciated, underappreciated technology of counterinsurgency convincing us to waste our fucking time. That's still in Rodriguez. So as I explain in Black Racialization and Resistance, Black students and professors are aware of the struggles of those before us and come with this conflicted sense of gratitude and or obligation. It leads many of us to commit time and energy to discussing, researching, generating reports and policy recommendations for universities even while simultaneously very much aware that such efforts are not necessarily likely to affect change. Universities, policies and procedures are by definition intended to work for the university and to protect its determined interests. As existing power relations are challenged in the broader social sphere, institutions activate the means they have in place and that have worked so far to avoid, placate, and manage concerns and demands for change. Sometimes, often, they do this in relation to the same concerns and the same demands again and again from one era to the next. So I write about a student-led campaign for Black Studies, for example, that was sustained over 10 consecutive years throughout the 90s at McGill, with students taking it upon themselves to work with members of local Black communities, to raise funding, do research, write articles and reports, sit in we can only imagine how many unbearable administrative meetings, and to pass on the struggle from one cohort of students to the next. In interviewing one of the students involved in the final years of this sustained campaign, I noted that it seemed to me that the university never took the development of Black studies on as their responsibility. It just kept falling to the students. Studying this particular history, it just becomes so obvious that the university administration sought to maintain the appearance that the institutionalization of Black studies was being given serious consideration. The student replied that for them, there actually had never really been that expectation. 
they had known that the university administration was not taking on Black studies as a priority at the institutional level. The students schooled me on this point, noting that this is why, quote, from a pragmatic perspective, whether or not that's ethical, you need a sustained engagement. Otherwise, it's going to be off the table, unquote. So returning to this quote in preparation for this talk, I've been able to think further with it and its implications than I did when I conducted the interview some eight or so years ago. In the book, I share that the campaign for Black Studies at McGill couldn't help but remind me of the unarmed, uh, unnamed protagonist of Ralph Ellison's book, The Invisible Man, who discovers that the president of his former college has sent him on a pointless mission to keep him away from the college from which, unbeknown to him, he's already been expelled. The strategy of the college president was quite simple. Hope him to death and keep him running. And that's, of course, a quote from the book. So certainly many, many of us can increasingly relate to this in relation to the demands of our jobs in the university. Our hope keeps us engaged. The institutions bombard us with unattainable volumes of bureaucracy and workload expectations that we can never quite catch up with. It is indeed one of the central characteristics of racial neoliberal capitalism and the universities we now find ourselves in. As Ronaldo Walcott has recently noted, while we're all meeting academic demands and expectations to produce and produce and produce more, to publish or perish as the masochistic saying goes, even those of us who are committed to the work of radical scholarship are most often removing ourselves from the daily work of organizing in community to sit alone at our computers. This, in part, is how scholars come to be disconnected and separated from the people, and worse, come to think of ourselves that way. So this, in part, is um, what Dylan Rodriguez is rightly identifying as counterinsurgency, making clear the functioning of the university as part of a broader carceral state. So thinking alongside US state policy documents, and anyone can do the same as I have in relation to the Canadian National Defense Counterinsurgency Operations Manual, Rodriguez is referring not only to military actions and international contexts that we might assume, but to the, quote, full spectrum of pacification, isolation, and domestication strategies that extend beyond violent state repression in order to defend, protect, and stabilize state power. So Rodriguez describes, quote, a contemporary liberal progressive counterinsurgency um, that functions as, quote, a loosely coordinated block that consists of large philanthrop philanthropic foundations, liberal think tanks, academics, and he leans heavily on the academics part because as, as somebody who works in a university, as well as elected officials, media pundits, nonprofit organizations, celebrity activists, and social media influencers. So his point is that it's a big totality. He argues that while members of this liberal progressive bloc may articulate support for certain, quote, compartmentalized versions of abolition, Black liberation, and decolonization, um, even this limited support is always already conditional on their particular interests and comfort in the system that we actually have. And that system, to quote Dylan again, must be fundamentally and irreparably disrupted or destroyed. So Rodriguez's analysis holds in looking at the Canadian manual, which defines an insurgency at its most basic as, quote, an uprising or insurrection against an established form of authority, normally a government occupying authority or social structure. So the manual notes, that's that was the quote, now back to me. The manual notes that insurgencies develop out of a certain dissatisfaction for the social structure or for the government, and they're more likely to occur in, quote, states where there are inherent racial, cultural, religious, or ideological divisions that lead to a lack of national um, cohesion, unquote. It emphasizes throughout that insurgencies are political problems, not solely military problems. Hence, the military's role is actually primarily a supportive one. Counterinsurgency then also involves, quote, paramilitary, political, economic, 
psychological and civic actions, and quote, a wide range of agencies, elements of power and capacities that must come together in a unity of purpose to defeat an insurgency. Finally, rather than the death or capture of, insurance, of insurgents, which risks legitimizing their claims and increasing sympathy for their cause, the most important goal of counterinsurgency is the quote, provision of security to the population, and I'll add read security as surveillance and policing, and the reduction, and I'm quoting the manual here, the reduction of popular support for the insurgency through reform, unquote. Key to all of this is narrative. And this is where, you know, we really come in as knowledge producers, as people who are dealing with words all the time, as people who are constantly making and telling and recycling stories. The stories we tell ourselves and one another, the stories of the state and its institutions are all central to this. And I'm quoting the manual one last time. The power of the narrative cannot be understated. Information operations, also called influence activities, must work to counter the insurgent narrative and its supporting propaganda. Countering the narrative will require the symbiotic use of words and deeds that seek to redress the grievances exploited by the insurgent narrative while promoting the desired narrative of the host nation government and coalition." Unquote. Word, sound, power. Many of us know Sarah Ahmed's work on non-performative speech that fails to bring about the effects it names. The function of non-performative institutional discourse is to misrepresent naming as doing. This is why they need our words. They make for more believable counter-insurgent uh, stories of reform. This is why not only um, do we need to find and use words that express what we mean them to. This is why we need to study and learn and discuss the implications of our words and the stories we tell. This is why we need to recognize and interrogate the politics they implicate, obscure, and advance. So let me conclude this story by sharing it. Let me conclude this section by sharing a story from EU Cree scholar, storyteller, and activist, Dr. Alma Moses. Alma wrote this story as part of a co-authored publication by members of Students of Color Montreal in 2013. And Alma's section of our article is titled, Coyote Goes to University and Tries to Teach Indigenous Studies. What is decolonization, asks Coyote. Don't know, says Raven, looking very perplexed. Well, I go and visit my relations whenever I please, but I knew a time when it wasn't the case. Those were very difficult times when you had to sneak around at night so, you, so the Indian agent wouldn't see you, and you had to make sure people who'd tell on you didn't see you either, continues Coyote. But what does your story have to do with decolonization and student movements, asks Raven. This is precisely why we have to tell our stories, even if people are not keen and don't like them, so people know about them. As Thomas King writes, don't say in the years to come that you would have lived your life differently if only you had heard this story. You've heard it now. Ah, you and your Thomas King quotes, says Raven, annoyed at Coyote. And what do you mean by sneaking around at night, asks Raven. Well, back in those days, you needed a special permission slip signed by the Indian agent to leave your reserve. You had to say the reason, where, and how long you'd be gone. Now, I don't think the Indian agent would have signed it for you to go to a protest. He'd say it promotes idleness just like dancing and drumming and anything to do with Indian customs. But why do you support the student protest? What does it have to do with us? 
Well, with the tuition hikes, my thinking is that it'll be even more difficult for Indian students to get funding from their bands. Many already do not have access to university. Many Indian children have to leave their communities to go to school because they do not have schools in their community. That was the dream of a young girl, Shannon, as she marched to Ottawa to bring awareness that her community needed and still needs a school so that the children can go to school. Coyote takes a sip of her tea. You know what? I learned so much by listening to your stories. Where do you get your stories? Asks Raven. Visiting my family and friends across the country and listening to their stories. That's how I know these things, answers Coyote. But, but, but that's not, says Raven. Not what, asks Coyote. But that's not very academic. That's not scholarly work. That's just plain old stories. Some would call them dumb and stupid stories. Stories that go off in tangent and we don't know where they're going. Raven is very confused and not fully understanding where Coyote's story is going. Section four, a time of promise and a time of hope. Returning to Professor Henry's lecture in February, Annette described the newly found institutional interest in Black studies and the per pursuit of a more equitable university. And she described it as making for a time of promise and a time of hope in Canadian academia. She added that it's also a taxing time for Black faculty, old and new, who are expected to, and indeed even often wish to, spearhead these initiatives and to make the university a more equitable and diverse space. The bottom line, she said, and I'm quoting her here, is that all the wonderful initiatives mentioned means that someone has to do the work. So what does it even mean to have hope within the context of what Annette reminds us continues to be not only racist, but a deeply patriarchal institution? What is our work? Another Black student I interviewed provides an example here that we can draw on. She spoke about how when the culture and practices of the union she worked for and belonged to started becoming increasingly patriarchal, the formation of a, of a women's committee was proposed as the solution especially given that the union had previously been led by two women uh, presidents, she was outraged at the suggestion. And she argued that this was not a way to make the union less patriarchal, but the opposite. It would cede the organizing space to a dominant group and contain women as an issue to be managed. Going along with the idea of forming a women's committee would have contributed to the resettlement and normalization of the patriarchal culture of the union. It would have contributed to a myth that male leadership was the way things were and always had been. We have to move with a constant awareness of power relations and a constant side eye for what we are offered by the institution. We cannot participate in the sustained myth making. Universities are and always have been deeply materially involved in imperialism and nation state building and in making and sustaining warfare in extractive capitalist industries and in turning land into property. And on this latter point, I want to offer another example as I've been somewhat compulsively preoccupied with it. First, because of the ways in which many universities are built on land stolen from indigenous peoples. And more recently, as someone who's moved to Toronto, where you know capitalist gentrification and the resulting houselessness is just so painfully stark and um, accelerating. So just this week at an AGM of my faculty association, um, members were grappling with what is to be done about a lack of affordable housing in Toronto, given how this impacts the lives of faculty who are renters, as well as the university's ability to recruit new faculty. Um, these are significant issues for sure. And by the way, issues that um, impact me greatly. I'm a renter and pay an, an, an outrageous amount of rent. Um, and they're, they're, they're significant issues and everybody should obviously have um, access to affordable housing. I'm very much implicated in this. And so it was a, a conversation I was really interested in, but I couldn't get past the fact that we were having this conversation as a subpopulation of people who, generally speaking, make six-figure salaries. 
As different options were considered, many modeled on those of other universities and many demonstrating the particular unlivable, uh, the particularly unlivable conditions in Ontario and the especially inadequate support provided to faculty by U of T. All I could keep thinking about were my friends and comrades and student comrades who are forced to live hours outside of the city and or in unlivable apartments that they can still barely afford about all of the comrades who are forced to live in the hellish conditions of the housing shelters and who live in parks and ravines and under bridges year round because housing is a booming capitalist for-profit market that doesn't care about people and about whether they, we live or die and how. The increasing financialization of housing is of course racialized and most deeply affecting and displacing black, indigenous and poor and working caste people whose incomes and access to social support is increasingly being eliminated. And for some scholarship on this, I wanna refer folks to the work of my colleague at Toronto Metropolitan University, um, Nimoy Lewis, who is conducting and writing up some really scathing and crucial research on this um, that pulls together the contexts of both um, major cities in the US as well as here in Toronto. So, you know, what the implications are um, or what are the implications if as faculty members in this situation, um, we even consider hoping for uni the university to buy up more property downtown in order to build affordable housing for us and our colleagues. I don't mean for this to suggest that we shouldn't be concerned for ourselves and for one another. And I certainly don't mean to suggest that some among us, regardless of salary, may indeed also be housing insecure and precarious in ways that we too often assume are just somewhere else out there uh, happening to someone else. This is about choices and what we consider as viable options. As Taiwo points out in his book, if we're really concerned about listening to and centering the quote unquote most marginalized as EDI discourses are so eager, eager to proclaim, it calls on us to take seriously our commitments to those without housing, food, and drinking water. Taiwo points out that usually in academia, we take centering the most affected to refer to quote, handing over conversational authority and attention to whoever is already in the room and appears to fit a social category associated with some form of oppression, regardless of what they have or have not experienced or what they do or do not actually know about the matter at hand, unquote. Rather than playing the game then according to the rules and predetermined strategies for a potential short win with, you know, short term win for ourselves, Taiwo instructs us to focus our intention instead on the quote root political issues that explain why everything is so fucked up, unquote, word. In conclusion, and to revisit the questions I started with, whether or not an equi equitable and diverse university is possible, I think really depends on how we're imagining equity and diversity and the university. It depends on whether we are willing to become inclusions or if we seek a more radical change that produces a different university. If we seek to buy into the university we have, it seems pretty clear in the current era that we might be able to do that sacrificing whatever parts of our whole living selves don't fit for the sake of the institution and a seat at its table. Future historians will be able to find our reified ideas and carcasses and accolades within the institution, like the ants and plants in a piece of amber. Our difference will make it more interesting and give it character. If on the other hand, we are committed to the creation of a different university, then we have to wrestle with what that might entail, including the parts that we simply cannot imagine and surely seem impossible. We must do so knowing that this will always, in all ways, be the more difficult way to proceed. We must claim no easy victories, no purity. We must acknowledge that we are all complicit and implicated in that which we critique and resist because we work in and at times unavoid unavoidably for corporate institutions. As Richard Eiten teaches us, the excluded are never simply excluded. 
Their marginalization reflects and determines the shape, texture, boundaries of the dominant order and its associated privileged communities, unquote. The academy needs our word sounds and we can choose what and how we bring it. Academic EDI initiatives are milquetoast business as usual without radical organizers, scholars, and scholarship to push them beyond the institutional colonial capitalist imagination. In May 1969 on the Dick Cavett show, James Baldwin was asked if he felt that there has been any progress. Noting the hubris of the question, he replied that insofar as the American public wanted to think there had been progress, they were overlooking the fact that, and I'm gonna quote him here, perhaps I don't think that this Republic is a summit, a summit of human civilization. Perhaps I don't wanna become like Ronald Reagan or the president of General Motors. Perhaps I have another sense of life which in fact, my situation here has forced me to trust. And perhaps I know more about you and your institutions than you know about me. And perhaps I have a judgment on them. And perhaps I don't want what you think I want. And there's nothing that you can give me. And perhaps there is something that I can give you, unquote. There are many anti-colonial scholars with a range of identities, identifications, and politics who are not here as add-ons or inclusions and are not trying to buy into the university we enter. That is to say that not only do we refuse the logics and the project of the university, but we also refuse the notion that our work as scholars has been predetermined and prepackaged in ways that leave us no choices. For whom do we do the work? We do the work that we do for our people, the people, never for the beauty or value of the institutions in and of themselves. We work hard, not because the institution demands that we jump through its, ho its hoops, but because we demand that there is more to our work than doing so, and we will not give up doing activist intellectual work that matters. We do the work out of a stubborn hope for and belief in the impossible. We do the work out of a love for life and for the possibilities that we have caught glimpses of, of a different way of being together and of caring for and about one another. Thank you. <laughs>